for a variety of reasons, not just officials who can't, but markets don't seem to be pricing in properly the inflationary effects of these policies or the inflationary effects of the fiscal policy. And so I think by a year from now, the Fed's going to be raising rates uh, with a very high level of confidence. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to another conversation in our series of episodes that focuses on markets and investing from a global macro perspective. This is a series that I not only find incredibly interesting as well as intellectually challenging, but also very important given where we are in the global economy and the geopolitical cycle. We want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent experts to help us better understand what this new global macro driven world may look like. We want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. Please enjoy today's episode, hosted by Alan Dunn. Thanks for that introduction, Niels. Today I'm joined by Adam Posen. Adam is president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He has had a long and distinguished career as an economist. Over his career, he has contributed to research and public policy issues on monetary and fiscal policy, focusing on central bank independence and inflation targeting. He's also written around the challenges of European integration and the evolution of the Japanese economy. He has been a consultant to numerous U.S. government and international agencies, has been the economist at the Fed and the Bundesbank. And between 2009 and 2012, he was an external voting member of the Bank of England. He's also the co-author of the 1999 book on inflation targeting, and these days is a frequent commentator on macro issues. So, Adam, delighted to have you with us. How are you today? Great, Alan. Thank you for having me on. Hello. So we always like to ask our guests, first of all, how they got involved in their respective fields. So what got you started as an economist and interested in uh, public policy? Well, I was... In a strange, nerdy way, I was always interested in international policy and thought I would end up at the juncture of research and policy. But I was originally more of a foreign policy, national security person. And I happened to be coming out of uh, undergraduate when uh, the Berlin Wall came down. And uh, that got me shifted into being an economist uh, in pretty short order. Interesting. Well, that, that, that's very interesting timing, kind of coincides with kind of a very big structural trend is that the global economy went through in that period. So I think we might pick up on that. But one thing I wanted to kick off with today was uh, you wrote a piece in the Financial Times recently called The Curious Case of Central Bank Convergence, where you talk about how monetary policy reactions are very similar across the US and Europe, despite some fundamental differences uh, in, in their economies. And it, I mean, my, my reading of it, uh, you, you very much uh, highlighted the recent episode as further evidence, I guess, of, of the success of, an, of, of inflation targeting. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. But I want to emphasize that it was a surprise to me, um, the evidence, um, because I always, coming from a political economy background, intellectually, uh, more than my distinguished co-authors, Bernanke, Mishkin, and Laubach, I had sort of less faith that independent central banks with inflation targets alone was enough. Because if you look back at the 80s and early 90s, you had very costly disinflations like Volcker, like Thatcher, you know, on and on, um, which were not consistent with the idea that credibility and transparency were all you met, all that matter. But it turns out if when I try to look fairly back at the last few years, it looks very much 
in line with the theory, frankly, that Bernanke, Laubach, Michigan, and I and others talked about, which is if you have a credible long-term anchor for expectations with an independent central bank talking transparently, you can ease in the short term and get it back. Now, again, I think if the Fed hadn't started raising, committed to raising a lot when it did, and ideally even a little earlier, we might be singing a very different tune. But ex post, it turns out it looks like the expectations channel of monetary transmission works. Okay. I mean, there is a view in the market in particular, at least from some commentators I read, that maybe central bankers got a little bit lucky in the episode. Obviously, we had an energy spike, uh, oil prices and European energy prices spiked up, we came back. Obviously, we had goods prices spiking in relation to COVID, but then normalized. You know, so, so some commentators are suggesting, I guess, uh, as a variant of transitory, that things would have normalized anyway. Sounds like you wouldn't necessarily agree with that. No, I, I think you, you got to have a reason why it comes back. Because even if we say, and this is why I talked about the idea that the central banks were all on the same page, sort of, at, at similar outcomes being a surprise, that um, huge difference in energy consumption and energy market structure in U.S. versus Europe versus U.K. The huge differences in labor markets, not so much U.S., U.K., but versus some parts of Europe. The huge difference in exposure to imported food as well as imported energy, the size of the government, all of these things are very big. And so even if you were team transitory, or as you say, the markets now see it, it should still be surprising to you that, yeah, sure, things start coming down when the shock starts coming down. But the fact that such different transmissions, such different economic structures didn't have differing effects needs an explanation. Right. Because, I mean, just straightforwardly may have been the same global price shock in food and energy or in supply chains. But the share of that in the consumption basket, the share of that in CPI uh, or in HCP, HICP is very different. So that's why I end up, I think, with good reason and a bit of surprise, end up thinking, well, it really was monetary policy because otherwise there's nothing that's similar across the countries. Yeah. Okay. And um, you touched on, um, you know, how maybe central bankers might have been a bit faster to, to tighten. Um, and I mean, you talk about in your piece, you know, uh, on, on this uh, the central bank convergence, I think you call it um, kind of the end of history moment for, for central banking in the sense that there seems to be no alternative now. But that's not to say, you know, inflation targeting isn't without its critics, it's certainly around, uh, you know, inf- uh, financial stability issues. And I mean, looking back at that kind of post-COVID era, I'm, you know, I'm talking about 2021 when monetary policy remained fairly easy. I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think that was a mistake? And, and were, I mean, in that whole period, maybe even back to 2019, central banks too keen to try and push inflation up towards 2%? And did that have adverse economic impacts down the line? I view the mistakes as being made mostly in 2021 and the first half of 2022. I I think it was entirely reasonable for central banks facing a global pandemic, which was not something they expected or were prepared for, to worry about both short and long run damage. Short run, just how much disruption there be to the economy, long run, as Fed Chair Jay Powell said repeatedly, worrying about scarring in the labor. But once things turned around, and that was clear in Europe very quickly because Europe, UK, even Japan did a good job of deciding we're going to keep programs in place to try to limit the burst in unemployment, to try to limit the pain from the energy price hikes. And we're in the US case where unemployment shot up enormously, but came right back down. Um, and so my show said, okay, phew, we dodged a bullet. This is where we're lucky. Let's pivot. And you had in the U.S. in particular, but in other places to a lesser degree, fiscal policy going on and being expansionary even after the legitimate emergency needs during COVID, the legitimate worries. Again, once it became clear, you want to be able to turn around. And since central banks can turn around policy much faster than budget policy, they should have been even more willing to turn it around. But I don't think it was the inflation targeting regime. I think it was some wishful thinking, um, particularly at the Fed. 
and some blindness to responding to fiscal policy, which I think, as we may discuss, sets up a further mistake that seems to be on the horizon. And uh, I mean, the point about financial instability and, and inflation targeting, I mean, it's something that comes back at, from time to time. It was there, you know, maybe immediately prior to the financial crisis. Yeah, but it's, but it's a garbage point. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, just fundamentally, right? Uh, we had financial instability in the obviously the global financial crisis, and it was clearly attributable to deregulation and poor supervision. I mean, I was there at the Bank of England when we were cleaning it up. You know, you can't tell me it was loose monetary policy, especially since the Bank of England before I got there had been tightening. Similarly, the financial instability we saw with. Silicon Valley Bank and the other banks, mid-sized banks that blew up a year and a half ago in the U.S., there is obvious smoking gun that they were given a special carve out under congressional pressure with the vice chair, the then vice chair of the Fed's blessing and totally lousy supervision. And the rest of the system, which had better supervision than capital provision and liquidity provision since the financial crisis, did not suffer any knock. So no matter how many times people say this, it's false. So from your perspective, macro prudential policies can address that point. Not that, macro no? prudential policies, micro prudential. Micro okay, sorry. Okay. So no, it matters. I mean, it's a distinction. What I'm saying is make sure banks have enough capital, make sure they have enough leverage, make sure you're following their books, make sure you're monitoring them, enforce it. That's micro prudential. That's a macro prudential is this nonsense that Central banks can, in a judgmental way, fluctuate the amount of capital or liquidity over time. And that I'm not a huge fan of. Okay. So you touched on, you know, coming out of undergrad years in the in 89 Berlin, Berlin Wall coming down. And you wrote the book with Bernanke and uh, co authors in, I think, 1999 or so. So this whole kind of uh, period we've had for inflation targeting has had that favorable period of disinflation, that kind of global trend. And we've had a particular set of circumstances in the global economy. Um, we had a, a Gary Gerstel on the podcast recently. He's written this book about the end of the neoliberal order. But that period was all around neoliberalism, free markets, disinflation. Do you think that was a more easier period? Or, I mean, did central bankers have a tailwind behind them? And might we see a more challenging uh, period going forward from, from an inflation targeting perspective, do you think? Yes, I do. And in fact, I started warning about that shortly before I went on the Bank of England committee a dozen years ago. Um, we, we have a couple things going on that are going to make it harder. Partly it's what you said, that we, we went through a period where there was just through some combination of good fortune and some structural developments, a lot of things damping down on inflation. But more importantly, damping down on inflation volatility. We just got lucky. There weren't energy shocks. There weren't pandemics. There weren't wars. And sadly, uh, for climate reasons and geopolitical reasons, we should expect there's going to be more shocks, more energy and food price shocks, more wars, sadly, more migration, all kinds of things. Those are real things. And the cent all the central bank can try to do is manage the second round price effects of real things. So yeah, it is going to be more challenging for the foreseeable future, which is five to 10 years. And I guess linked to that is the, maybe the political support or the political dimension. Is that something um, that, that could come, could waver? I mean, from the perspective of, you know, in this cycle, we never had the situation where the central banks were, at least for the Fed, where they had to kind of maintain tight monetary policy in the face of weak conditions. So they obviously tightened policy, growth was still solid still solid now. So they've never really had to face a trade-off between, okay, do we keep policy tight here now to get inflation down, even though the economy is weakening? I mean, do you think if they had that dilemma to face, would you still have the political support for of monetary policy? Well, you know, the only way to judge that is were they willing to do it ex ante? And remember, the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of England and some other central banks, all in late second half of 2022 through first part of 2023, were raising rates when the overwhelming bulk of forecasts were for recession. So they were willing to do it. Now, again, ex post, I, had, I and a few colleagues like Karen Dynan at Peterson, we had said we didn't expect recession. 
right. Um, but, you know, the central bank certainly thought there was a high risk of recession and they were still willing to do it. Um, I think if anything, the political situation was as awful as it is in the US and Europe and the UK, um, for central banks isn't worse because what we've seen is how much people in high income economies really still hate even low levels of inflation. And even after years of low target inflation, it turns out the public is asymmetric in the economist, economist jargon, right? They, they hate overshooting inflation more than they hate undershooting. And, and the second thing is, as we've seen in Turkey and India, as we've seen in Europe, um, even very nationalist politicians in the end seem to decide, well, the messing with the central bank is probably not a good idea. Now, presidential candidate, former president Donald Trump in the U.S. is threatening to mess with central bank independence in the U.S. if he is elected. Um, and as a couple of colleagues of mine, former officials, David Wilcox and Morris Obswell, have written, that's pretty dangerous. Um, but... So the U.S., I think, because there is such a direct potential attack on the rule of law, trying to increase the power of the president if Trump gets back in, you know, there I think there's an issue. But I don't view that as politics in the sense that there's mass pressure or opposition to the central bank. That's the views of Donald Trump. Okay, just uh, in relation to a couple of other topics on around inflation targeting and and the, uh, the construction of that, I suppose one of the things we've heard more recently, or, you know, and it often I guess surfaces in times like this is, you know, the the case for in- increasing the actual inflation target. Uh, and going back, you know, maybe ten years or so, we had already had this from Olivia Blanchard, you know, suggesting maybe four percent was a better level. And and you know, obviously, arguably, maybe now is not 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 the best timing. But I mean. With the benefit of hindsight, you wrote the book, you know, 1999, if you were writing it today, w- would the target be any different or would there be anything about the construct of the kind of inflation targeting approach that would be different? I mean, speaking just for myself, because I know uh, my senior, couple of my senior co-authors disagree, but speaking for myself, I think one of the things we got wrong in the book was we talked about the idea that targets should be varied, not frequently, but the inflation target should be subject to change over time as the structure of the economy changes, the nature of shocks change as we learn things. Um, if you obviously, if you vary it every few minutes, you're, you're, you lose all credibility. But the idea that with parliamentary or legislative assent, you can vary it every several years was in the book. And we didn't foresee something probably people in markets may have already seen, which was Announcing inflation targets kind of like announcing an exchange rate peg. Once you announce it, it's very hard to decide to change it. Um, New Zealand tweaked theirs. The Bank of England tweaked their definition. But that headline number, even if there seems to be good reason to vary it, people are very reluctant because just like when you're on an exchange rate peg, you're worried it hurts your credibility. You're worried it looks bad. Um, And so... Before this most recent inflation, I was aligned with Blanchard, another colleague of ours, just Yon was on this tack. A number of us, Jason Furman, were out there saying, okay, you know, uh, given the zero lower bound problems we saw during the last recession and crisis, given the way labor markets work, given how much we've been undershooting the target, probably a 4% or at least a 3% target would be better. I still think on the economic merits, that's true. And it's also partly an operational issue in the sense that essentially you have a choice right now of they're going to run the target, keep it officially at 2% in the major central banks, but they're going to overshoot it for a few years. And, you know, and I don't know why that's better per se than raising the target. If you're just going to accept that you're going to be averaging higher for a while. But again, I got to come back to what I just said a minute ago, Alan. I mean, I am struck by how much pu- the publics and high-income democratic societies, let alone middle-income countries, uh, hate even small amounts of inflation. That became clear. And you have to respect the society. So I am not as convinced of the merits of changing the target as I once was. <laughs> 
And in your book, you, uh, you talk about you have a whole series of case studies, and one of them is around Bundesbank and how they used to maybe change their target on a one-year horizon, but have a kind of a structure, longer-term target. Is that a model? Does that or does that that, that might work? Does it create issues? Yeah, I, I'm actually proud of that. The um, Tom, the late Thomas Laubach and I wrote that chapter, most of the case studies. But anyway, that chapter in particular we worked on, and um, I think it was important not just academically for but for policy and markets to point out that here supposedly the very, very Germanic anti-inflation Bundesbank, which indeed it was, uh, was credible and kept inflation lower than everybody else, uh, but was still quite flexible um, in the short run. And in that same chapter, we discussed the Swiss National Bank, which similarly ended up with very low inflation compared to others in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Uh, and it was harder, of course, because it's a smaller, more open economy than Germany. And similarly, they were flexible. They varied their targets over time. So again, from an optimal economy setting point of view, there is a case for doing that. But going back to the op-ed I just wrote, which is sort of my take on lessons from the recent events, in the end, it looks like these fine differences in central bank targets and communications actually don't seem to matter. Uh, so we spent a lot of time looking at the details of that. There are a lot of other economists, both academics and at central banks, who between the mid-90s when we started writing and now have you know done work on central bank communications, niceties of central bank legal structures, central bank committee structures, central bank uh, targets. Again, it, it's all nice, but it doesn't seem to really matter very much. Um, uh, these smaller aspects. Basically, you have a low inflation target. You're transparent in talking about it. You're independent enough. You can pursue it on an operational basis. That's it. And all the other stuff doesn't seem to matter. And, and within that, the key is that that anchors expectations. Is that right? Yeah. Which, of course, is somewhat circular. Um, yes. You know, and that goes to why I was skeptical, more skeptical than some of my co-authors. I've been pleasantly surprised because it's sort of like, how do we know the expectations are accurate while inflation stays down? Why is inflation staying down? Because the expectations are anchored. You know, um, we do have in government bond markets, in in particularly in places where there's index government bonds or five year, five year forwards you can play with. We, you have some measures of what seem to be long term inflation expectations. You do have surveys that are done both by independent organizations and the central banks that also gives you some sense of long-term expectations. Most of these are not great on levels, but if they show a sustained change in one direction or the other, they seem to have information. So I don't want to oversell it. You can, in some proximate way, track the anchoring of expectations, but it is it, there is a little bit of sort of you're chasing your tail. And Ben Bernanke and the monetary theorist Mike Woodford did a very important paper after our book came out, but while the inflation targeting debate was still live, um, about the idea that you could end up, as economists say, with multiple equilibria if the central bank too closely chases the market expectations, uh, you sort of end up creating, un potentially creating uncertainty. Just so, so um, you touched on being transparent around it, and, and I think related to that is kind of communications as well. And I mean, we've gone, you know, over the course of that kind of 30, 40 year that you, you've been in economics, a huge change in, in the communications approach, you know, back in, even in the 94 tightening cycle, I think they just announced a rate hike or they didn't even, you know, or maybe they did, but uh, before they didn't, then, they didn't they, make yeah, it yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Now we've got forward guidance at every at every meeting, and every line is uh, uh, you know assessed. And I saw Stanley Druckenmiller, you know, well known hedge fund manager, saying that the Fed should stop forward guidance. It's just creating more confusion. On the back of you know, I think maybe the I think it was the May FOMC and certainly the December FOMC. And um, I mean, do you think it's gone? I mean, do you think it's important, or is it going too far? And I'm wondering from the perspective of um, how that forward guidance influences financial conditions, which could then have an impact on the economic outlook. You, you know, you, you're in this kind of uh, 
you know, trying to second, assess the second and third order impact of any communication statement. Does that yeah. complicate thing or, or do you still think forward guidance is, is a positive thing? Well, I never thought forward guidance was a positive thing. Actually, okay, transparency sorry. <laughs> is not the same thing. In 2012, as I left the Bank of England, I gave a talk at the Fed's Jackson Hole Conference in which I said forward guidance is stupid. Um, and I stand by that. Um, communication more broadly in the sense that if you know where you're going or you know what you're looking at to decide where you're going, you should tell people that is, is valid, uh, is useful. The reason I'm harsh on forward guidance, and then I'll get to Drucken Miller and your point, is because forward guidance is the idea that um, your statements, very specific statements about the path of policy um, can influence policy, influence outcomes in this, as a tool in and of itself. So it got coined during the crisis when it seemed like monetary policy was pushing on a string, either because you couldn't cut rates anymore or because QE didn't seem to be that effective out of a, outside of a crisis situation. Um, but it becomes what you and Stan Druggenmiller and others have talked about, that it becomes this sort of chasing the tail and you get a little, seems like central banks, the Fed and Bank of England both, I think, have been subject to this, getting a little too caught up in not surprising markets and meeting expectations. And, and that's a level of fine tuning that doesn't make any sense um, for a public policy point of view. It, you, you, you know, especially since there's going to be noise in the sense of there's going to be variation in the actual economic outcomes, the price developments in the, in, that you just can't control and you don't want to react to. And so I do think you, there has been a problem again, I think in the Fed's case in particular, for a while at Bank of England, so lately, where there's just been too much fine tuned communication and the, confused with this additional confusion with this message of so-called data dependence. Um, again, the problem isn't so much saying we react to data and here's the data we react to. The problem, or we intend to do this policy if we're on the right track. The problem is saying, A, we don't want to surprise anybody. That's, that's, you know, you may not take delight with surprising people the way, say, BOJ Governor Kuroda did when he announced a negative rate after telling everyone he would never do a negative rate, right? I mean, that's bad. But it's also not a first order concern. I'm, I'm, I, if, if I get suddenly new data, that really is profoundly changes my view of the economy. I'm going to change whether or not it surprises anybody. I mean, who cares? So anyway, it's, it's, it, I'm sorry to sound vague, but it's, it really is a matter of degree. And I think the central banks have gotten too much in the habit of micro managing and worrying too much about what current financial market expectations are. I mean, we saw this with the whole process over the last year, year and a half, where, you know, the Fed accelerates rate hikes and all kinds of people in the market say, oh, they're not going to do that. And various people like me said, no, don't do that. Um, just listen to the Fed. And then they did that. And then they said, then there was, oh, they're going to cut 17 times in 2023 and various people like me said, no, listen to what they're actually saying. They're not going to do that. Or eventually do this. You know, you, 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 at some point you, you just have to not be that concerned about day to day things. Now this is the top traders podcast. So for traders, the upshot in my view, when I advise investors is generally you take the opposite side of any, any bets that move a lot due to central bank communication, because they're usually going to be overreaction. And I think in particular with the Fed of late, Chair Powell just seems to tack, you know, so that if, and whenever he makes a statement, he's correcting to the dovish or the hawkish side from what his last statement was. And so on a more than in intraday basis, I would basically say if there was a large move due to a statement, um, I would take the other side of that bet. And I similarly think that was true for Bank of England. ECB less so. Just on the, on the question of 
the impact on markets and then financial conditions. One of the, I suppose, curiosities of the last uh, number of years is obviously different people have said the stance of monetary policy is tight or not, kind of depending on what you're looking at. Obviously, nominal rates went up high um, and, and quickly, but, but there's a suggestion, there's a this debate on, well, are they above neutral or not? Uh, at the same time, now real rates are have got higher because inflation has come down. And then financial conditions have fluctuated depending on what equity markets have done in credit markets. So as a policymaker, you know, somebody who's sat at the table at the Bank of England as part of your discussions, which of these is more important? Is it nominal rates, real rates, financial conditions, changes in rates, or all of the above? Um, I feel strongly the two are much more important than the other two. I feel that um, financial conditions, even though, as you say, they're highly variable, and then um, changes in rates if, are, are the most important indicators. And I feel that both level of both nominal rates and real rates uh, on the Fed side or on the Bank of England side, the instrument rate on the short end, are vastly overrated. And you can see this right now. Um, so finally, we're getting a little bit of slowing in the residential construction market in the U.S., but, you know, Usually in all past Fed tightening cycles, at least since the war, uh, a 500 basis point rise in Fed funds rate would have completely cratered the housing market. Um, we have what I still believe, so that tells you there's a lot of other things that go into this than just the rate. Um, we had six months ago a number of Fed officials, including the New York Fed president, John Williams, saying, very explicitly, oh, inflation's coming down, um, therefore the real rate of interest is going up. And people like me, in this case, that was more in a minority, that's right, um, said, you know, that's not a sufficient statistic for, for credit conditions. You know, we're looking at a world where spreads on junk bonds over investment grade bonds or corporates over government bonds or, very, or even the duration spread, the yield curve, all have not moved very much for a given fit thing. So how are you saying, you know, you, you have this mythical real interest rate, but it doesn't describe what's going on in the economy. And I remember fighting this issue, as you said, when I was in, inside at the central bank and there were discussions and one of the Fed governors at the time from the crisis said, well, the great thing about monetary policy about moving the short-term interest rate as it gets in all the cracks. And my response was, that's exactly wrong. The whole point of this crisis is that financial markets are segmented and during a crisis, things get worse. And so that segmentation gets even harder. And so the, the short-term Fed funds rate is contributing to part of the, the credit conditions, but it is not determinative. It doesn't get and now that we have, you know, especially in the U.S., but throughout the advanced economies, non-bank financial intermediaries playing such a large role in non-financial credit, um, we have large international capital flows. We have very large moves in savings behavior in the U.S., in China, to a lesser degree in some other countries. You know, the, the idea that this one interest rate is is a sufficient statistic strikes me as very mistaken. Now again, that that doesn't solve the problem because as you say, you know, you you create a financial conditions index of whatever construct and you have things, you know, day to day movements and NVIDIA at some level affect credit easing. And that's not accurate either, but it's closer to accurate in my view that it's the changes in these, these, these interest rates and what that says about the effectiveness and path of, of monetary policy and then the overall credit conditions that matter. Yeah. So putting that into context of current markets, obviously we've had, we're in the midst of a big run-up in equity prices. Credit spreads are tight. So I, I, I don't have enough financial conditions indices lately, but obviously short-term rates have been you know, sticky around 5%. So, so that is a, an upsetting factor, but, but certainly you haven't been tightening anymore and, and, and obviously have eased since last October. I mean, again, whatever definition of financial conditions you want to look at, and there have been various ones, 
they all suggest that a we are less than the most tight we were in this cycle, less restrictive. B that for the given Fed funds rate increase, they we seem to be less restrictive than we've been in the past. Um, and on many of them, it would seem to indicate we actually have pretty loose financial condition. Mm. Oh, um, I mean, there is still a, a view. Uh, around the lags of monthly policy that, that, and it's kind of linked to, I guess maybe you've answered it already, but you know, the view being that you bring rates, rates to five, five and a half percent. Okay. Things don't crack immediately, but over time, because of the lags, they will, you seem to be saying you don't buy that. Yeah, but that's, but I don't because, so if you go back to roughly February, March, 2023, there were a bunch of people saying that. Uh, some of the notable investment banks, like Tax was talking about that. Some of the Fed officials were talking about that. Wide range of people were talking about that. And the reason I date it to then is because then came Silicon Valley Bank and First, First Republic Bank and people got distracted. But at that time, everyone was very intent on this idea. It's just lags. It's just going to get there. And, you know, when we run out of so-called excess savings, then things might crash or, you know, and I kept saying, I don't think that's right because that would imply zero forward looking behavior on the part of markets, which zero is extreme. And I don't think that's right. That would imply that for some reason that nobody has specified, um, the effect of interest rates on housing construction in the U S for example, was much more lag than it ever had been. And there was no good explanation for that. It, and then just in general, it was just this insistence that somehow lags were going to be much longer in this situation, even though we had visible evidence, again, of not terribly tight credit. <laughs> um, just didn't make any sense to me. And I think this has been proven out. So yeah, I mean, there's some tightening effect and some of it takes time but to be talking about tightening that was done in the second half of 2022 still barely having an effect in the middle of 2024 when the Fed started tightening the, and all the central banks started tightening in early 2022. That's that you, you need an argument for why the lags are so much longer in this case, which nobody had ex ante. Again, the only argument that made any sense would be with the consumer sector, this so-called excess savings. Excess savings, yeah. But as Karen Dynan and I, both argued starting in 2021, you know, the excess savings argument was kind of a misnomer because that assumed there was some hard fix that savings rates had to go back to in the U S at least exactly where they were in 2019, which was a multi-year high. Uh, and again, that was a reasonable assumption, but there was no reason to think that that was a fixed point. And if anything, the fact that people accumulated so much savings during the, the COVID years and the U.S. government and other governments were actually, I think, appropriately generous in supporting people in the worst of COVID should have given people more confidence they didn't need to save as much in a precautionary fashion as they used to. Now, again, I can't prove that. It was one possible outcome. But the idea that everyone had faith that somehow, and I just saw a, a Bloomberg reporter retweet a chart from the Fed San Francisco about running out of excess savings. And, and, you know, all we've seen is a very small decrease in, in the rate of consumption. Uh, there's no reason the U S I mean, it may not be ideal either for households or the economy as a whole, but there's no reason the U S can't have low savings rates again for several years. And there's intuitive reason why they might. So. Sorry to go on so long, but it's just, I don't, these, these statements come out and I don't think people really think them through. I mean, they have a surface initial plausibility, but you, you have to, if you want to trade and think on the basis of macro trends, you got to, you got to think it through a little more. And yeah. Well, everybody obviously points to Milton Friedman's famous line of it, long and variable. So it's kind of an easy, easy one to defend, but. In, yeah. In, well, in, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking reciting of out of date scripture isn't a good analysis point for, um. Yes, no fairness. Sure, sure, sure. Invest. Yeah. One of the other things that you get 
when you get like an economic scenario like this that's unusual or that surprise people is then, you know, theories like, oh, actually the Fed needs to cut rates uh, to slow the economy down because, you know, high rates is benefiting wealthy savers, etc. And high rates is not working because of that. I mean, you know, obviously you get structural changes in the economy that the percentage of baby boomers might rise over time. But but do, do you think that's plausible or do you think that take that kind of an argument seriously? I, I, I think taking it seriously in the limited sense that the structure of the economy, as you just set out, has some effect on what we would call the monetary transmission mechanism. So if you're trying to forecast specifically the lags and the vol- and the impact on different sectors in the economy, household behavior by income decile or something, those things matter. And so I think the ECB just came out with a working paper, literally, I think today, some publication, um, in which they talk about the fact that the effects of quantitative tightening vary across countries over time, depending on who's doing the same. So, I mean, there is something, there. but I want you to think about the, the, the overdoing it where people switch sides, right? So there was a point at which during quantitative easing, I and the others in the, on the MPC in the UK and on all the other central banks would get attacked. Oh, all your, your cutting rates, your, your quantitative easing, all you're doing is blowing up asset bubbles, which are unfair to small savers, you should raise rates. And now you're quoting people who are saying, well, by raising rates, all you're doing is helping the rich people and now that you should cut rates. So think about, and many of these are the same people who are saying these things. So, you know, the again, if you want to drill down and think about specific structural aspects of the economy, that's worthwhile. But the people who make these grandiose directional claims generally contradict themselves in the short and are contradicted by the facts in the short matter. It is roughly the same people who are saying we were totally unfair to small savers and helping rich people by quantitative easing and low rates. And now they're turned around saying we're totally unfair helping rich people and hurting, hurting people by having high rates. Well, it can't be both. And, and the answer is the real mistake a central bank can make is having the monetary policy rates out of whack with the state of the economy. Yeah. I suppose in general, what I mean, having been inside the central bank policymaking uh, forums, you know, is, is the level of research at that level of granularity, like the, the, Fed, the Fed obviously is a model of the economy, but is it based on more general relationships, re- yeah. rates go no, up it's, 3%, it's, consumption declines it's, a bit. It's, it's very, um, eclectic's a little too strong, but it is it is a multiplicity of views. So what happens is the Fed does have a baseline model. Um, it's called FERBUS, Federal Reserve Board model of the U.S. Um, that's like the Bank of England has a, a, mo- a central model, the ECB has a central. These models are used for two things. They provide a baseline forecast and they are used for what are called policy experiments, which are not literally policy experiments, but are you run simulations. If we did this policy, what would happen? Um, but all of them in all central banks, it, you know, uh, even PhD economy labor is cheap compared to economist labor is, pay, is cheap compared to the value of getting a central bank decision. So you can have 300, 400 economists and you assign a dozen of them to looking at micro data about savings behavior, how it varies across the income distribution, depending on this and the other. And so then you try to bring those things together. And that's why there isn't a mechanistic policy. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why not, but in the good world, that's why there isn't a simple mechanistic policy world, because if the committees are doing what they're supposed to do, and making use of the staff in the way they should, you're having this ongoing discussion. Okay, here's the base. Here's new research or updated research looking at this development. Here's some anomalies in the data. Oh, let's try to make it all fit together and decide what makes sense. So, sorry, it is, if you're doing it right, it's messy. And, and, in, and in the Bank of England where I was, there are these things called the agents, I shouldn't say things, they're people, 
who have regional assignments and their job is to talk to businesses and households and institutions in their region, report on that. And the Federal Reserve has a different thing, but now it is called the Beige Book, which is each Federal Reserve district collects a lot of anecdotes from businesses and workers about what's going on. And again, it doesn't fit directly into your model, but sometimes it can be very revealing. So the example that the former governor, Mervyn King, used to give about the utility of the agents, which I think was entirely valid, the agents saw the surge in migrant workers in the UK before it showed up in the national data um, in the early 2000s, and how this was having a disinflationary effect. It was reducing labor supply constraints. It was reducing wage pressures. Uh, it was increasing. And that fed into decisions made at the Bank of England in the early 2000s that I think in retrospect, and I, I think we're right, but which were dis difficult ex ante, where based on the national level data and some of the standard models, it looked like they were getting more inflationary. But because they had this hint in a consistent, interesting way from the agents, they knew that. And they said, okay, let's risk on going easier for a little longer because it looks like we're getting positive labor supply. And the great example of a similar sort of thing is Al Greenspan in the mid-90s. Um, you know, of all the things that justified his title maestro, what really was the right thing that he did was roughly around 1996, he figured out, which was, again, couldn't be proven ex ante, but was right ex post, that the economy in the U.S. and some other places, but mostly the U.S., was becoming much more efficient. Productivity was gaining. Information technology was having an effect. Before it was showing up, even in micro data, he figured it out. And partly it was the beige books. Partly it was his own network um, thinking very hard. He looked at different kinds of data than the, the model did. And there are economists who worked at the Fed at that time who have stories about him being sent off him sending them off to chase, you know, what's the weight of the economy? And it's like, what the hell's the weight of the economy? We don't track that. We don't even know what it means. And at that time, very distinguished academic background policymakers, including Janet Yellen, who was on the board, mm -hmm. who later, of course, became Fed chair, so now Treasury Secretary. And Alan Blinder, who was this very distinguished Princeton professor who went on to become vice chair, got it wrong. And even though they were progressives, they were out there arguing against him in 1996, 97, saying we have to raise rates. 98, we have to raise rates because we don't see this yet. So anyway, just to say, and Alan Blinders made this point very well, um, just to say you need some kind of model to have some kind of base consistent base to structure the discussion so you don't just opine off the top of your head. But if you're doing it right, you're still taking into account these qualitative, anecdotal, as well as where you started this point, Alan, you know, research on different deciles of the, of the economy behave different. So we talked a lot of different factors there. I mean, taking all of that together, um, I mean, where do you see things now from an economic perspective? Um, We've had maybe a little bit of softening in the, in the data in the from the real economy in the last month or so. But so, what's your take? Well, let me let me put it in terms of the U.S. economy. I can also talk about the U.K. or the Euro area for Ireland if you want. But let me let me put it in terms of the U.S. economy. Um, in my view, Alan, there are three, four major things together come together, all of which you masterfully took us through, even if I blathered on. First is the Fed is not as tight as they think they are. So even though the economy is softening, it's not very accommodative and I don't expect any sharp downturn. Second, that fiscal policy in the US, notwithstanding what the election may lead to a split Congress, is likely to continue to be stimulative, at least compared to the baseline assumptions people are making, and possibly be much more stimulative coming in 2025. There's going to be defense spending, there's going to be infrastructure spending, there's going to be industrial policy spending, irrespective of what happens in Congress. And that's 50% of the government budget. And possibly big tax cuts and other things. Third, we arguably are at the start 
of uh, the information technology jump. That's a whole other topic we can go into. Uh, it is people would like to be, Jay Powell has said, I mean, they'd like to be Greenspan in 1996 and say this is coming, and but we don't know yet. It's probably going to take a little longer, um, but that's there. And then fourth, and this is something I work on a lot in my day job at the Peterson Institute, um, anti-trade, anti-migrant policies in the U.S. are already inflationary and contractionary, and under Biden, too, they're likely to get a little worse, and under Trump, too, they would get enormously worse. And that's going to be inflationary, and if you do the anti-migration policies, including deportations, that's going to be contractionary. So you get stagflation. And so, and as I sort of said a few minutes ago, for a variety of reasons, not just officials who can't, but markets don't seem to be pricing in properly the inflationary effects of these policies or the inflationary effects of the fiscal policy. And so I think by a year from now, the Fed's going to be raising rates. Uh, it was a very high level of confidence. Interesting. We've talked to a, a number of those factors. Obviously, fiscal policy is very important, as you say, and that's been the thing that's probably surprised a lot of economists. Um, you know, de de deficits of six, seven percent when the economy is full employment. Barry Eichen Green was speaking at Jackson Hole last year, talking about debt and deficits, and saying, you know, they're here to stay basically because political issues and the way you get it down is either uh, austerity, which is no runner these days or growth, well, which could be linked to productivity, as you say, or higher inflation. I mean, the point that people in the macro world always say is, oh, the central banks, the governments are going to let inflation go higher to deflate away the debt. Yeah, that, that's... Is, does the, that ever come up in the conversation in central bank world? It does not come up in central bank conversations in high-income democracies, full stop. I know people insist it must be true, but... The fact is, if you do the algebra, um, it takes an awful lot of inflation to make a material change to the debt. So, you know, the debt picture in the U.S. didn't, the net debt over GDP picture in the U.S. didn't go up quite as much one for one as the large deficits would have told you they would, um, given the high inflation we had in 2020, 2021, 2022, but it still went up a lot. Um, you have to really get a lot of inflation to, to move the needle on that. And generally, you then lose it back, at least some of it, on interest rates. Similarly, on productivity growth. Um, we published a volume on this a couple of years ago. Productivity growth is great for real incomes. It's great for the economy, but it's not necessarily that helpful to debt sustainability for governments because generally your long-term interest rate, your real rate goes up one for one roughly with an improvement in productivity trend because the cost of capital reflects the rewards to capital. And if the average reward to capital is going up because productivity is going up, you pay a higher interest rate. So G um, and R are both going G up. G and R go up roughly. And you probably get a little more on G than you do on R. So like with inflation, it helps, but it's not, it doesn't take away the problem. And um, my colleague, Jason Furman, um, in various places recently has, has, has made this point that even if we do get meaningful improvements in growth in the U.S., whether it's productivity or something else, um, that's not enough to really get you back on a good fiscal path. You have to raise revenue or you have to do massive cuts in spending. And and so, how, yeah. so how do you see that playing out? Do you see a possible fiscal crisis at some point in the next number of years? I mean, there's there's two answers to that. I, I they the the first one is if there is a fiscal crisis in the next few years, it is likely going to be completely due to political breakdown in the U.S., not due to market forces or economics. Um, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen and it wouldn't hurt. It, it both very much could happen and will hurt, but it will be driven by. Um, radical behavior if Trump and a majority of Republicans hold one of the houses of Congress or public violence or divisiveness in an extreme way that leads to a breakdown of governance. And I sadly, I, I well, happily, I'm not expert to put a number on that. Uh, sadly, I think that's a very real possibility. 
Um, so, so you could get a fiscal crisis in the U.S. for that, but it's not going to have anything to do with the numbers. It, it's going to be just because markets wake up and say, oh, we've always given the U.S. a pass because we've always assumed if push comes to the shove, they could cut spending and raise taxes enough to get things under control, which at intervals the Congress has done. And if that faith goes away, that's when you have a fiscal crisis. But maybe a fiscal crisis is too strong a word, but you know, what we saw maybe last kind of summer going into October, yields get up to 5%. Yeah, to, and you know. that, that, that I think is, that is fair. So it, I think it is entirely reasonable um, to, ex and it's part of the reason I say, I've been saying along with Larry Summers and some other folks that our star, which again is a non-measurable concept, but, you know, the long run average 10 year bond rate on treasuries, the real 10 year bond rate on treasuries, if the economy is at its growth path is going to be higher from the next several years. And a big piece of that is fiscal. Now, if you look at the CBO numbers, of congressional budget officers, the watchdog in the U.S., they estimate, estimate, you know, every persistent percentage point increase in debt to GDP is only worth, you know, a couple basis points. Um, so over time, it just keeps going up. It doesn't go up by that much. Uh, there are other ways to think about this that would suggest that it's probably not that linear, that uh, crowding out, but also fears of, of misallocation of money. And as people realize that you're spending more on interest payments as a share of government outlays than you used to versus useful things, or at least politically popular things, it, I think interest rates go up more. And when you're in this zone, again, there's no magic number. It's not, you're over 100%, therefore bad things happen. But when you're in this zone of large peacetime deficits, large non-pandemic deficits, the response to markets will be a little harsher. So again, not to mince words, crisis, no barring political breakdown, but economic pressures sustained higher interest rate on U.S. government bonds, which then filters through to the rest of the world. Um, yes. And one more thing which I'll throw in is the U.S. and the Chinese governments are both putting up barriers and discouragements to capital flowing out of China into the U.S. And that was another thing that was keeping down interest rates, as Ben Bernanke spoke about the savings glut in the speech, famous speech early in his chairmanship. Um, and, you know, some economists say, oh, don't worry about that. They can try to put up barriers, but then the money just goes to Abu Dhabi or Singapore or Zurich and then gets rerouted or Dublin and then gets rerouted into the U.S. I think the kinds of things the U.S. and China are doing actually do have some traction. And so we potentially end up with a world, in my view, where that further increases U.S. interest rates because there's just simply a, a smaller supply of savings they're drawing on to fund larger supply of treasuries. And it drives down domestic Chinese interest rates because they're getting lower returns on capital because they're not as diversified and money's trapped there. But on net for the world economy, the U.S. interest rate is, even if the Chinese economy is large, in financial circles, the U.S. interest rate is much more important. And so we end up with higher rates for longer. And obviously we've had the kind of the treasury tactically issuing more bills to kind of yeah. circumvent that. I mean, how sustainable yeah, is that? That I don't, that I don't like. I, I'm one of these, I'm not, I'm sure I've offended a bunch of markets people with my remarks on this call and I'll just further reinforce that. I remember several years ago, a lot of people, including in markets, were saying, the treasury, why the hell, if Austria can issue a hundred year bond, why the hell isn't the U.S. treasury issuing? And I completely agreed with that. I, I didn't understand why the U.S. treasury wasn't going way out on duration issuance, given how low rates were. And people on the TBAC, the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, which is a lot of serious market people um, at the time said, no, 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 that is that's an illusion. That's not the way to go. That'll disrupt markets. We need to have issues across the curve. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. 
But what the U.S. Treasury is doing now strikes me as even worse. So it's, it's bad to forego the opportunity to finance a lot of good stuff at low rates. It's even worse when you've got temporarily very high rates, why you would try to issue in short term as much as possible. And there I do see the disruption to markets, potentially. So I don't get it. Okay. Final word briefly, productivity. Is, uh, is AI going to change the world in the short term or not? I, I, I honestly don't know, but I am reluctantly becoming a productivity bull. Um, and I do this as a macro forecaster, so not pretending to know anything about technology. I think there are two things that we've seen that are necessary but not sufficient for general purpose technologies to take hold. Um, one is, and we've seen this railroads, we saw this in the, in the 90s with fiber optic cable and the internet. Um, one is you need to see labor hoarding. You need to see in a disaggregated way, lots of employers adding or retaining workers that on current GDP forecasts, they don't seem to need because they know something's in the air. And we've seen that. Um, the other thing you need is crowding in of investment in a particular way, not just that we have, um, you know, lots of investment in NVIDIA or in chat GPT or whatever, but that huge amounts of investment go in because nobody knows who's going to win the competition. They know that at some point, five, 10 years down the road, there's going to be a dominant company, but nobody knows which one it's going to be. So you, everybody invests, hoping they, they get the right one. And there are signs, it's harder to document, but there are signs of that going. And so if, to me, these two things are early warning indicators that we are having a positive productivity shift. And then if you combine that with the stories of experts who you've spoken to about what, what generative AI can do, then I'm persuaded it's coming. Is it coming in the next six months? Probably not. Is it coming in less than five years? Probably. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Adam. This has been a tremendous conversation. Thanks very much for doing this today. So make sure to follow Adam's work because as you can tell from today's conversation, we're living in a truly global macro driven world. So from all of us here at Top Fitters on Float, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back soon with more content. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.